Acceptance and Commitment Therapy for Adolescents by Dr. Jagyasa Ipsita Patnaik, MD, DMP, PDS, Child Psychiatry, St. John's Medical College, Bangalore. Assistant Professor Kims. Uh, for as online expert, we have Professor Dr. Sarda Swain, Director, MHI, and Editor, Odisha Journal of Psychiatry. Subject expert, Dr. Samrat Kar, Consultant Psychiatrist, The Brain Institution, Katak. And as moderator, we have Dr. Prashant Mahapatra, Senior Consultant and Chairman Award Committee, IPS Odisha State Branch. I would like to invite Dr. Samradkar on stage and kindly brief us about the theme. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Uh, thank you, Organizing Committee Sudhita sir. And uh, Rostral actually particularly dragged me here physically. And I've been sore throat. So when on the way, I asked Google, Kims, and uh, Google gave me direction to Thames River, UK. So today our topic is uh, acceptance and commitment therapy. This uh, therapy is different from rest other therapy. Because rest other therapy, we discuss about maladaptive assumptions and thought. Suppose uh, adolescent, it is an adolescent, adolescent boy, um, suppose he would come to me and ask me, <clears throat> when I was going, I was in love in a, with a girl. The girl used to date me, but she didn't listen to me. So I tell her, no, these are all maladaptive assumptions and uh, it should uh, rationalize it and try to avoid and uh, <clears throat> these are all fusion of thought try to avoid it but in acceptance therapy you have to accept and these maladaptive uh, things and after accepting you will have directions your different goals suppose the girls and the girl didn't ask you anything didn't see you so you will in other therapy you will ask them suppose the girl might have missed you or she is having sore throat, or she is having a family illness. So there are some maladaptive assumptions. But in case of acceptance, you will find that this these negative, though this is a maladaptive uh, thing, I have I have different goal. Suppose the girl, um, I should uh, ask the girl, or I will chat. I should send a chat to her so that we I'll, we'll accept it and we will have different goal and we'll take action. So the Jigyasa is the best person uh, to deliver uh, speech. I think I should hand over now to Prashant sir, moderator. Prashant sir is there. Moderator. Uh, and the online expert sir will speak at the end. No. The sir online expert will say something in between Prashant sir is coming. Yes, Prashant sir. 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 I think I should make social distance. I should go and sit. The speaker in this session, Dr. Jigyasa Ipshita Patnaik. And uh, regarding ACT, preliminary things have been already explained by Samrat Kaur. Anyway, Dr. Jigyasa Patnaik, she started medical career in this institute schemes. That one she did MBBS from these schemes. That one she did uh, MD from Mental Health Institute, AC Medical College, Kota. And uh, DNB, she is completed in 2018. Now she is uh, continuing as assistant officer in this institute also. She has various publications, books. I need not. Uh, I think the time is short. There is no need to say so many things. And uh, today, actually. I was doing my morning emergency. During leisure time, I was going through just ACT. And uh, 
and uh, i am also close to various uh, many friends and son and daughter of uh, many friends colleagues what i understood that uh, almost all students maybe teen or adolescents they need the act but thing is that uh, we are not uh, doing it in a very proper way or we are not doing it i didn't heard from any clinical psychologist we don't have time clinical psychologist that they are doing act but uh, all the students even i think i need also act because uh, most cases also i know do not accept many things and uh, forget about the commitments so anyway let us hear from dr jigyan sir let us uh, hear with patience a uh, very good afternoon to one and all so uh, i'll be talking about acceptance and commitment therapy i would like to uh, first uh, thank uh, our moderator and the chairperson for a brief introduction to the topic of acceptance and commitment therapy as rightly pointed out by you sir uh, this particular therapy is uh, developed for all sorts of psychiatric illness those that we can be uh, diagnosed as a syndrome under dsm 5 or icd 10 11 whatever and for also uh, maybe improving or making the quality of our life more meaningful and purposeful so act is uh, one of the most recommended treatments for adolescents in particular because that is something where a lot of things are developing adolescent crisis we are not very really sure if it is depression if it is adjustment disorder if it is just a crisis that is happening so that is why acceptance and commitment therapy is one of the first treatment of choices for adolescents uh the right side the uh, a photo that is there will be coming to it repeatedly so don't worry about it the complexity of it i'll simplify it for you uh, as we go on so uh, how is this uh, act different from cbt the first question is in cbt we talk about cognitive distortions and what is wrong and we talk about reprogramming of the distortions and making it correct so that is what cbt is all about but what we do in acceptance and commitment therapy what we do is we talk about no resistance like what is is not to fight with it make space for it it's okay to be sad at times it's okay to be you no know, like not be happy not have something it's okay you no know, like acceptance and not resisting it is what we talk about in acceptance and commitment therapy so uh, the scheme of my presentation will be first i'll be talking about uh, the happiness myths Uh, this is as referred by uh, dr ras harris uh, who is the pioneer in act then i'll talk about the hexaflex this particular figure that you are seeing will be coming repeatedly i'll be talking about each of these uh, domains then i'll talk about certain metaphors in act because uh, that is something which is very interesting and that is what adolescents really like when you talk about stories and uh, tell them situations that they relate to and last uh, if time permits we'll have a hands on experience for 3 minutes and last i'll be summarizing it so if we start with uh, like uh, what is happiness and uh, how happiness myths are what are we uh, the things that we call as myths first of all uh, 
if we decide and we stick to any of these myths, then definitely we fall into something called the happiness trap. Like for example, the first uh, happiness myth is, happiness is a natural state of being. Like suppose you provide good, loving emotions uh, and relationships, a person is supposed to be happy. But in reality, that never happens. Uh, loneliness, frustration, anger, hurt, these are the natural emotions every person experiences all throughout life. It is like emotions are like seasons that they come and go. Like, for example, it's the summer. We are supposed to be like, it's to be hot. Suppose it's raining. It's supposed to be cold and dampy. It's winter. It has to be cold. Similarly, emotions are something that are natural. Like, suppose you are exposed to a very frightening or a disgusting environment. It's normal to feel scared. It's normal to feel sad. And that is the first myth. The second myth as we come to happiness is based on the first myth. And uh, it says that, uh, happiness means feeling good. And the dictionary meaning, if we say, it is pleasure and contentment. And if we stick with this notion, then uh, this notion of happiness tells us, like suppose being happy or being content is what being happy is all about. How long does it last? Suppose the most uh, happiest moment of your life. And uh, suppose you're happy. Now think how long this happiness can last without a second thought coming to it, like an anger or frustration or disappointment. So maybe the new definition of happiness is not just being uh, feeling content, but also having a rich and meaningful life. Like for example, having good relationships, loving people around you. And uh, when we take this example also, like suppose a lot of us, uh, a lot of the audience here are parents also. Like for example, having a child is one of the most beautiful feelings. They incite a lot of purpose and meaning into you. At the same time, the child also invites a lot of negative emotions in you. Uh, any of the parents can volunteer, you know, like, do they cause always lovey-dovey kind of feelings? Or sometimes they actually make you, you know, like, uh, some other kind of feelings. Anyone could volunteer? Any parent here? Tell me, Shradi. She is laughing. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So very rightly said, rage, anger. Okay, uh, Dr. Ravan has something to say here. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So if we summarize it, and if we take the opinion of all the other people here, you know, like it will come around frustration, anxiety, anger, and humiliation at times, you know, like what if in the entire CME, my child starts crying or asking for something I'm not able to give. So all of that uh, causes a lot of negative emotions as well. I talked about guilt also, like I said, frustration and guilt. So it is really strange to see that something that is as loving as a child, you know, like it is one of your own products, can incite such strong and negative and powerful emotions, negative emotions. So it is important to know the meaningful life, like for example, something that we really want to do in life, maybe it is a, a loving relationship or the career that you want to build. It gives you meaning and purpose. At the same time, it also incites a lot of negative emotions. So the second myth that happiness means feeling good may not be always true. Now coming to the third myth, which is based on uh, the first two myths also. Like suppose you're not happy, that means you're defective. And uh, all we have, we psychiatrists have a range of psychiatric disorders to diagnose and we start prescribing pills and you have to take this and that. And that causes the stigma in psychiatry that we all deal with. I'm not saying that disorders are not there, but maybe if we obtain this particular approach in uh, talking to patients, they may be open they may be opening up more and they'll come to you and you'll be more accepting to what we talk about. It. So, uh, so if we say that, uh, it is not that if you're not happy, it does not mean that you're defective. It means it's normal, it's okay because all of us have emotions and it's of various range. Uh, so when we come to ACT in particular, and why did I give that introduction? There are three particular uh, important domains where ACT works. It's called the triplex. The first is being present, that is making contact with inner experience. The second is opening up, that is making room for all the feelings and the negative thoughts that I was talking about. And the last is doing what matters, that is values guided action. I'll be talking about each domain. We'll be giving the exercise first so that we understand the concept. And then I'll be talking about the theoretical part of it so that it's more interesting as we go on. Uh, so I'll start with the first thing that is uh, uh, 
opening up, opening up, that is uh, diffusion and acceptance. Uh, for that, I would like to request Dr. Sharmishta. She has kindly volunteered to be the dummy for the first uh, demonstration. So I'll request Dr. Sharmishta to uh, sit on the chair so that uh, she can help us understand what we are going to do about it. Okay, uh, so what uh, we are going to do right now is all of you can also practice with you if you want. Like, uh, uh, can we request you to have your eyes closed by your fingers and place your palms really close to your eyes? Yes. At the same time. And uh, when you have your palms that close to your eyes, uh, can you just reflect, ma'am, what do you see? Yes, what do you see? Okay, uh, that's right. Now, can you just place your hands a little away from your eyes, a little bit? Yes. Now, what can you see, ma'am? Okay, anything else that you're able to see? Okay, right. Okay, now can you just distance your hands a little further? Yes. Now, can you see what you're able to see? What can you describe it, please? Thank you. And can you now put both of your hands on the table? Yes. And now can you see what you're able to see? Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your support. So if we reflect on this, what we can see here, like suppose we get fused to a particular feeling or a thought or an emotion, and it is very close to us. It's very close, like our eyes. Then we almost get fused to it, and we are able to see nothing but the darkness or only the feelings, and we tend to identify whatever we see with that darkness. So the purpose of cognitive diffusion is helping you to defuse from your palms. Like when you try to distance uh, your palms for your eyes, gradually you are able to notice that your hands are different and there is darkness because of your hands, and there is gold outside. Initially, there was some light, as ma'am said. Then she was gradually able to see some part of whatever the world is around her. And then she was able to see everything very clearly. And when she also takes her hand and places it on the table. At that point of time, she's not fighting with her hands. She's just keeping it on the table, keeping it in a place, opening up and allowing it some space to be. So this is what cognitive diffusion and acceptance is all about. That you defuse from your feelings, you defuse from what your thoughts are and how closely you hold them. Have objectivity and make some space for them. Don't allow your hands to rest on the table instead of just being there in front of your eyes and covering what you look at. So these are the first two important constructs that uh, ACT talks about, is opening up, cognitive diffusion, and acceptance. So now we have uh, covered uh, this particular triangle end. Next, we go to the dimension of being present. Like suppose we talk about being present. Uh, all of us know currently the fourth wave that is going on is mindfulness-based therapies. Uh, and we have another session on DBT after this, which is also based on mindfulness. So uh, the most interesting and uh, formal thing that we all talk about is breathing techniques. Maybe something that we can suggest is breathing in and out 10 times. That is the first exercise. The second, which ACT describes in particular, is called the grounding technique. What we do here is suppose a patient is experiencing a lot of distress and a lot of anxiety. We ask the patient to sit and try to push the both the bit into the uh, ground, wherever the foot are there, and try to uh, forcefully keep pushing it. That makes the person realize that the foot is pressing against something and the muscles are getting tensed and that helps the patient to come back, uh, not patient, the client, uh, that is more appropriate, client to come back to being real, being present and being connected with what is there. And the third thing is noticing what is available around, noticing the people around you, noticing the things around you, the object, the sight, the smell, the uh, feelings around it. So uh, this is what mindfulness and grounding is about. That is the first part of being present. And the second part of being present is uh, having self as a context. So here I would like to request uh, one more volunteer, if possible. Uh, and we have uh, Dr. Swati. Dr. Swati, are you sleeping? <laughs> yes. Uh, can I just please, uh, like you can sit there. I just needed a volunteer. Uh, like suppose we give a, a statement like I am. And uh, we have uh, three sentences. I am dash, dash, and dash. How would you fill up these three sentences? It can be anything. I'm a doctor. I'm a, I'm a friend. And a doctor, daughter, and friend. Oh, 
Beautiful. So these are the three things. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Shwati. Thanks for your uh, uh, suggestions. Uh, but I thought I'll give uh, another example, just similar to that. You know, like maybe I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a female. This is what we have here. Yeah, I thought you'll say this, but okay. And then I'm standing maybe. So uh, now if I ask Dr. Swati, like suppose she was not a doctor, right? Suppose she was not a daughter also. Suppose she was a male. And she, suppose uh, she was uh, you know, like minority standing or a female or whatever. Suppose these three things did not happen for Dr. Swati. Would Dr. Swati still exist? Will she still be there? That is the question. And that is what ACT talks about. Like suppose uh, she is not a psychiatrist, she is not a female, and she is not standing. But she still is. So you as a context is much beyond what you think you are. How you describe yourself is just one part of you that does not completely define you. So that is what uh, this ACT self as a context helps you understand. So what exercise we do exactly this is the exercise we give to the client and then we ask them to write I am whatever they are and then we ask the client to write a prefix before that is I am having a thought that I am a girl. I am having a thought that I am a doctor. I am having a belief or I believe that I am a doctor. And whatever it is, this statement is also true, right? And now what we do is we give another third exercise to the patient and say the patient to write, I notice. I notice that I am having this belief that I am a doctor. So self as a context is much beyond what you actually think you are. And you have the ability to think what you are able to think and even metacognition that we talk about. You know, like you have the ability to reflect on what you are thinking. So self as a context is something which uh, ACT focuses on. Uh, to understand it a bit more uh, elaborately, maybe I'll give you this uh, metaphor of internal struggles and this is a chessboard metaphor. So what happens here, like suppose we describe a chessboard here. It's very interesting that uh, uh, suppose there is a black side and a white side and you start sitting on one side of the uh, chair, you start to get involved in the game and you start to get playing with it. So what happens is you start to fight, suppose you're on the white side, the positive feelings, you tend to fight with the black ones, that is the negative feelings. So you make a, a positive move, then there is a negative move as well. And these two sides are something that we keep fighting to win, to win a battle, which no one knows how long it is going to take and what's the purpose of it. So when you keep fighting, there's a lot of clash, a lot of uh, maybe damage can occur in the process and the entire attention is diverted on the game, on winning the game, and you actually lose the purpose or the enjoyment of the game. So what ACT says is instead of, uh, suppose, uh, suppose we uh, see this as one of the contexts in life, like suppose we take that we are actually dealing with a life as a chessboard kind of a thing. So what is the problem here? This one, there are innumerable nibble of positive emotions and innumerable negative emotions that keep coming one after the other and it is indefinite. And suppose uh, there's a positive, as you know, positive attracts the negative also. You, you start saying that I'm a good friend then something in your mind starts saying that, no, you're not. That day you did not turn up for that particular meeting that I asked you. Suppose you say, no, this time I, I'll make it. I'm good looking today. I'm like, what about your stretch marks? What about your acne? What about your thought belly? So positive feelings, positive emotions also come with negative emotions. And if we indulge in the fight and keep fighting all the time, we just lose our time fighting and struggling with our emotions. So what the ACT says, instead of being the white side or the black side, you just be the chessboard. Like you can be the chessboard, and positive and negative feelings can come and go. They may fight, they may not fight, but you don't have to get involved in the fight. If they come and go, what you enjoy is the game. That is what is the principle of ACT. And this is self as a context where you are neither the positive nor the negative, but you are the chessboard. So, uh, I'll come to this exercise only if we have time. I was thinking of a hands on, but because we're running short of time. So we have time. Find a comfortable position. Okay, uh, then maybe this is uh, this is another interesting uh, hands on experience. It is just a three minutes video. Uh, all of you can actually uh, try doing it here. Yeah. It'll We'll also have a reflective session after this, like how did it go? How did it go? And uh, what did you feel? Were you able to do it or not? Find a comfortable position. 
On either close your eyes, or fix your eyes on a spot. Whichever you prefer. Imagine you were sitting by the, the side of a gently flowing. Increase the sound of it. Find a comfortable position and either close your eyes or fix your eyes on a spot, whichever you prefer. Imagine you were sitting by the side of a gently flowing stream and there are leaves flowing past on the surface of the stream. Okay, uh, because Imagine it how clear, maybe then uh, I'll just read out the script for you because it's something that uh, we can practice. It's audible? It's clear? Will you be able to do it? Uh, then it's just a three minute thing like to start. Find a comfortable position and either close your eyes or fix your eyes on a spot, whichever you prefer. Imagine you were sitting by the side of a gently flowing stream. And there are leaves flowing past on the surface of the stream. Imagine it however you like. It's your imagination. For the next few minutes, take every thought that pops into your head, place it on the leaf and let that float on by. Do this regardless of whether the thoughts are positive or negative, pleasurable or painful. Even if they are the most wonderful thoughts, place them on the leaf and let them float on by. If your thoughts stop, just watch the stream. Sooner or later, your thoughts will start up again. Allow the stream to flow at its own rate. Do not speed it up. You are not trying to wash the leaves away. You are allowing them to come and go at their own rate. If your mind says, this is stupid, or I can't do it, place those thoughts on a leaf. When you feel comfortable, you can open your eyes and maybe we can reflect on it. Um, so some of you were doing it seriously. Uh, can I have hands who did it seriously? Okay, yes. We have a Santona and her friend there. So uh, Shantana, will you come forward? It is okay for you. Yes. And in the meanwhile, others can also, uh, because we'll take her version directly. Uh, were you able to do it? That is the first question that people ask. How successful were we able to do it? Not able to do it at all? Not even 1%? 1%, yes. So when you, yeah, please come. Uh, so when you try uh, doing a mindfulness activity, it is that difficult because when you talk about leaves on a stream, the stream sounds and uh, the noise around, it's so difficult. Please have a seat and take the mic. Yes. Can you please reflect on your experience? What happened? So 
So when I was uh, doing this, um, it was a bit difficult because my mind was racing with a lot of thoughts that were coming in. And I was also getting distracted a lot. But every time I had to bring it back to the focus of what I'm getting distracted by. And then uh, I somehow made this experiment earlier. So I was able to know what, what to do to next. And the process really felt good when the healing part of it was to write down on the piece of leaf that was there and let it flow away. So that was the portion that felt better and experiencing this, studying is different and experiencing what uh, it tried now was, was good. Thank you, Santana. So this is, uh, yeah, you can join back. So this is one of the very common responses that we have when we give it to our clients. The first thing is the struggle with actually getting into the exercise because there are a lot of racing thoughts, you know, like it sounds silly, will I be able to do it? Those kind of thoughts actually pull you back. But then as they start moving into the um, exercise, gradually what happens is they actually start to write down the thoughts Whatever thought it is, like suppose you say, no, I won't be able to do it. No, it's boring. I'm like, who does it? Maybe someone will deceive me. Whatever thought it is, we ask them to write it on a piece of leaf and actually allow it on the stream to flow. So that is how uh, we try to defuse from our thoughts and give it a visual impression of placing it on a leaf and allowing it to flow by. So leaf on a stream is an exercise where we try to practice all the different components. That is, here we practice the concept of diffusion, that is diffusing and writing your thoughts on a paper, acceptance, allowing those thoughts to be, and placing it on the leaf, allowing it to flow at its own pace, not rushing it through or not making it slow. Then being present, if the thoughts are not there, or even if the thoughts are there, we try to focus on the river, try to focus on what's around us. And that's what we covered so far. We covered being present, we covered opening up. And now the last part, doing what matters. This is a very interesting thing uh, that we talk about. Like suppose we talk about how to, uh, in the beginning we started talking about happiness is not about being content or being ple having pleasure all the time. It is about creating a rich and meaningful life. So how to create a rich and meaningful life is the next question. So some people said like achieve your goals. Maybe. So if we reflect on the process like maybe goals, uh, money, maybe one degree, or maybe having a good body, good physique, loving relationships, a big house, a big car, or maybe, you know, like as we gradually start achieving one and the other, goals and goals keep on increasing. You know, like how long do we enjoy one particular thing before we actually jump into another goal? So although we achieve success in a lot of things, happiness that we receive is temporary. Even if we have goal-based um, action that we do, we don't always happy because we again start going into that simply thing of that cycle of achieving more goals and maybe uh, if a Mercedes, maybe I'll buy, buy a, a private jet and all those kind of things. So uh, I'll give you a nice example here that uh, there can be a radically different way of thinking about life and thinking about values and purpose in life. Like, for example, let's take, uh, let's take this uh, um, car. This family was going to a trip to Disneyland and there were two kids sitting on the back, two boys. So both of the kids were going to the Disneyland, but one child were very extremely preoccupied with, are we there yet? Are we there yet? How long is it going to take? And the only thing that he was focused on is when are we going to reach it? Although the goal was the same, but the child was focused on the frustration journey. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? How the second child was also on the way. However, he was noticing the values that he cherished, the curiosity, adventure. He noticed how the grasses look like, how the farmland is, how the uh, huts are, how it's the different, how the animals are. And in the process, he actually also enjoyed a lot and the cars, yes, everything, everything that he could uh, notice. And finally, both of both these kids, they reached Disneyland. Both of them had a good time. They enjoyed, they really enjoyed. They reached the goal, they achieved the goal, they did what they wanted to. But one had a journey of frustration, and the other had a journey which was meaningful, and it was full of values, it was quite rewarding. Now, suppose we are on the journey back home, although both of them reached their goals, right? What happened is one child was frustrated. How long will it take to reach home? I'm tired, I'm tired, how long? So that child again had a journey of frustration. However, the other child started noticing outside. How does the world look like when it is night? Like, how, how are these stars shining? In the meanwhile, what happened is the car broke down. So what happened is uh, both of them disappointed definitely that is something everyone will experience they were not able to reach home 
So definitely both were uh, disappointed. And they had the car had to be taken up, and then there was this big truck which came, and they had to sit on the truck and on the side, big van. The child children had to sit and go. One child was definitely frustrated, and the other child. And then she started uh, noticing how different is the view when you sit on a higher kind of pedestal and uh, what else you can see. So this is the importance of having a values-based approach versus a goal-based approach. Although in this, uh, value-based approach is something about creativity, curiosity, courage, persistence, freedom. It is about the process and not necessarily about the goal. So if even if they do not reach the Disneyland, one child will have a journey which is rich and meaningful. Even if they do not reach the goal, they will have a journey which is worth living. But even if you reach the goal, the other child had a journey of frustration. So this is what uh, values uh, versus goal-based approach in life is. And this is one of the exercises that, uh, that we can do to help people learn about what are the various values. We do in uh, four different sections. One is uh, the work and education, that what do you want your values to be? The second is personal uh, growth and health. Third is relationship, and the fourth is leisure time. And then we ask the patient, like suppose in this domain, where would you place yourself? Like how consistently are you? Uh, like suppose this is a bull side, like this is like your hundred percent there, wherever you want to be, and here is completely away from it. So where would you place yourself? And whenever a child or a uh, client places himself, then we ask them to reflect. You know, like what can takes you take you towards the bull side? What takes you away from the both side. That is how we start to work on this particular exercise. Uh, and this brings us to the next and the last important point of this group is having a choice point. Like no matter what you do, um, uh, whenever, whatever time it is of the day, like for example, it is morning or it is night, no matter what time it is, all of us keep doing something or the other at each time of the day. Even if when we are walking around, even if when we are sleeping, that is also some activity that we do. So when we talk about uh, sleeping is an activity, that means it is a choice. We have a choice that we are doing it or we are choosing a particular path or a direction that we want to go. And if we say it very clearly, there can be two different directions to whatever we want in life. It is towards moves, that is towards the life we want, towards the values and the virtues that we want in our life. And certain moves or certain things that we do that actually take us away or in the opposite direction uh, where we do not want to go. For example, uh, for example, like uh, Dr. Samrat gave a nice example of a relationship. Like uh, suppose uh, there's, there's a girl and someone likes the girl and wants to propose, but maybe he thinks that maybe I'm not good enough and whatever kinds of thought are there. And what he does instead, it does not go ahead and does not uh, actually do what he's supposed to do. So he makes a choice of going away from what he wants in life. So that is an away move. And as a result of it, what happens is he gets a life which is not something that he really wants and definitely is frustrated. So choice is something that we give the clients the opportunity to choose. You know, like you have an opportunity to choose, make a choice. Decide what your values are. Every day, every single moment, you have a choice. You can actually create and achieve what you want the goals that you want, the dreams that you want, and it will not happen just by chance. There has to be different difference in the way you deal with the difficult thoughts and feelings. That will cause the change. Now, suppose we come here to, again to the same uh, hexa, uh, triplex that we're talking about. The last thing that is doing what matters, I talked about the values and I talked about the committed action. So committed action is actually the exercise that we do here is to help the patient make an informed choice to make him reach that choice point where he has to choose a towards move or a away move. And uh, to summarize all of it, being present is the first thing that we talked about. That is mindfulness and getting grounded. The second is acceptance, is non-judgmental awareness and making space for the negative feeling and the negative emotion and to keep it there, not struggle with it. The third is diffusion, where we try to diffuse from the negative thought or the positive thought, no matter what it is, and treat it as an object and not just the entire you. It's a part of you and not complete you. Then last, uh, then it's the self as a context where we talked about the chess and the positive and the negative emotions. So you are the observer. You are 
you are the person who can enjoy the entire thing and not necessarily be a part of you know, like the positive and negative emotion. Uh, then commitment and values. Values is to the bull side, we make a choice where our values are, what do we want to achieve, where we stand, and then we take a towards move and an away move. So this is what ACT is all about. And uh, if I make it even more simple, ACT is like acceptance, accept your reactions and be present. C is choose a value direction and T is take action. So even making it more simple, open up and be present, have values and make committed action towards those values. So with this, I end, I'll open for questions. Thank you. Uh, so currently it is uh, so much effective that uh, today around the 600 RCT was published on this and even more RCTs are going on. It's not limited to any particular thing. It's actually trans-diagnostic, trans-situational and uh, it has a lot of evidence. And because it is very easy to practice and easy to learn also, so practitioners are taking it up more also. One question here, can we use it? Is it for me or is it for, I think it is for Dr. Odin. Can we use it in a person with psychosis who not, does not want to continue maintenance antipsychotic? So uh, there's a big debate around that also, but they say it is that easy act. ACT means act, action, taking action, taking committed action. Yes. Not necessarily. No. I 
think it is both like making a choice you are also liable for what comes with it and as i said the happiness myth only positive does not come negative also comes along and that's what life is thank you thank you everyone Thank you, Professor Ma'am. Uh, now I would like to request uh, Professor Dr. Sardar Swai, Director MHI, and uh, Editor Odessa Journal of Psychiatry, to give some concluding remarks. If he is with us, he is. He is. Sir, uh, kindly unmute. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jigyan, for a very nice presentation. This is one of the debated presentation from psychiatry. Actually, I am extremely happy to listen the presentation. And uh, this is one of the most uh, recent and uh, important area in psychiatry. I think uh, everybody should practice it. But some, someone has questioned, uh, questioned the speaker that where you will learn this technique. Actually, uh, Dr. Jigyasa, where you learn this technique? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you take the initiative to teach this technique to all the psychiatrists. We can do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All my best wishes and best wishes to the to most brilliant uh, chairpersons, Dr. Pikimapatra and Dr. Samratkar. The so is well managed. Thank you, everybody, and uh, my best wishes for the seminar. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now, now I would like to call upon stage uh, 